pleasure to, well, I can't see you all, but at least to have you all here and introduce you the next ECMW forecast system upgrade. Um, this is actually number four in a, in a seminar series. Um, we repeat each seminar, so there's been two different seminars um, on the exactly the same topic. The previous seminar was, uh, the previous seminar was actually given by Andy Brown, Director of Research, in which he introduced the scientific background to the existing cycle. He showed you loads of different scorecards, and I've put on here the extended range impact on schools, um, which you're not going to see in this presentation, because as you also can see, there's not much impact this time. Um, but he's also given you a, a detailed background of different scientific um, updates, which have happened in this, or which will be happening in this particular forecast upgrade. Um, we call this Cycle 47.1, and I was reminded um, about yesterday that nobody else actually understands what cycle means. Um, cycle is just the next forecast we're using, it's not tomorrow's forecast, it's just the next instance of our forecasting system. We're doing this slightly differently this time, um, in the sense that you can ask questions immediately in the chat. Um, usually I would have answered the questions at the end, but it sometimes led to a bit of a, a confusion. If you have any questions, ask them instantly in the chat, and then there will be somebody, um, any of those people, um, available and be able to actually respond to you immediately. And then if you haven't really, um, if, you, if you want to re-ask the question slightly differently or something else is unclear, you can just do that immediately too at the plot at the time when we are there. Of course, there's also going to be time afterwards. Let's get to the meat, let's get to the bones, let's see what's actually going to happen. Um, this is our implementation timeline. Um, we're today on the 28th of May, um, and we are just imminently ready to, to propose or to, to, to release, to, to start the release kind of phase with the test data. Um, this is supposed to happen or will happen on the 2nd of June. Um, on the 2nd of June, you will have a full set of product services available. Um, that means test data, that means an easy charge, and it will be able, you will be half them until the operational implementation of the new cycle. The test data will be generated daily, um, just shortly behind the real time from the high resolution and the ensemble, and they're based on your individual operational designation requirements. Um, there's also a graphical display available. Um, actually, you can go to easy charts and you can compare 47 of one to the next upgrade compared to the existing cycle at the moment. And then we are aiming, of course, for an upgrade on the 30th of June and the first model cycle, which will be running um, with, the new, with the new system, will be the 600 UTC one in the morning. Um, you can see we came quite a long way. We actually started on the 30th of March with the implementation of this cycle. Um, we're going to go there hopefully for the 30th of June. 30th of June is, of course, our target date. The 30th of June, what we're trying to achieve. The 30th of June, what we believe we can achieve. However, things can go wrong and things can change. Um, we have a dedicated web page for you, and you can see it here. Um, it's actually quite a long name, and if you, if you type 4701 at ECMWF into a search engine, that page more or less come up. It comes up in the top three in nearly any search engine you look for. Um, not a very common combination, 4701 and ECMWF. Um, this web page is regularly updated and contains all the details you need to know. Even what I have, I'm going to say today, will be all on the, is, is all on the page. What Andy has said um, three or four weeks ago is all on this page. It's all detailedly documented. Um, and if you want to receive updates from this web page, so if you want to know if something has changed or if there's a if there's a news item, then just hit the watch button on this page. We're not sending out any more individual emails to anybody. If you want to want know something. Um, watch it, and then you can also get rid of it if you don't like it anymore. Enough administration. Let's talk about 4701, far more exciting. Um, I'm going to show you in the first instance a scorecard. Um, the scorecard you can also find on the web. Um, and just to quickly explain to you what a scorecard is, for those who don't know, the top half of a scorecard shows verification against analysis. The top and top, the bottom half shows verification against observations. And each of the columns is in a different region. In this particular case, I've shown you the Northern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, and the tropics. Um, and then you have in each of those regions, sub-columns, which are in this case here for the RMS error and the CRPS, 
Um, and when you go on our web page, you can see you can also customize that scorecard slightly so you can see a bit more. And in those are then the forecast days. So this is even subdivided even further. And in there, you see little boxes with forecast days from 1 till 15. And then you see in this particular scorecard example, triangles which go either up or down um, and which are red, filled or not filled or gray. The legend for those for those triangles is fairly straightforward. Um, you have actually um, up triangle and blue triangles is, is great. That's what I like to see. That's what we all like to see. That's what we all want to, to have in a forecast cycle. Red is less desirable, um, but sometimes explainable. Um, and I'm going to come to that in a second. Um, if a triangle is filled, the significance level is 99.7 is reached in terms of confidence. If it's not filled 95%, and then you have sort of um, um, going downwards in, 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 that, in that confidence interval. And if it's great, great, then there's, there's not really a clear significance in that sense. So you can see for each of those different forecast lead times, for each of these different parameters, for each of these different regions, you can very detailed in a, in a quick overview see what's actually happening. We use the scorecard mainly to have a quick look. This is not the only way we actually look at cycles. We look at loads of other aspects and diagnostics in a cycle and trying to understand as much as possible before we actually release it. Um, but it's sort of a, a nice, easy overview. Just to show you, there's on the web, um, a 47.01, the Ensemble scorecard. Um, you can pick different regions and you can do something completely new since yesterday, um, which was unfortunately a bug. So the yesterday presentation didn't see that. And I'm going to do now something which you shouldn't do. I'm going to go live now. Um, and I'm going to show you how you can use this particular scorecard. I hope you can see my screen. And if you click, for example, on here on the root mean squared error for the southern hemisphere, if you click on a button now, you can really clearly see the individual graph. Okay, you see normalized differences for all the lead times going up here. You can check the individual values if you want to. And below you have the control experiment, which is the current forecast system, and red, which is the next forecast system, which is the experiment. Um, so you can click on everything on this map and you can look at anything you like. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chance it anymore um, and go away from the live version again. Um, if you look at the scorecard um, and look at the extra tropics, it's actually mostly blue, it's largely improved. I'm gonna come to the few red triangles in a minute. If you look at the tropics, um, there's a clear degradation against own analysis and some mixed results against observations. Um, if we implement a cycle, a new forecasting system, it's never, it's never blue everywhere. I haven't seen one yet where everything was basically positive. There's always some trade-off somewhere. Um, this scorecard is based on 350 model runs, which are from December 2018 till mid-April 2020, so covering quite a few regions. Let's look at a few um, individual details on the scorecard. Um, if you look at the, at the blue areas here and look at the reduction of temperature areas in the stratosphere, um, you have here, for example, a plot with T50, um, Northern Hemisphere, CRPS. Um, control, as I said, is the existing forecast cycle. Experiment is the new forecast cycle to be implemented. Um, and you can see roughly a drop of 15 percent. The, the magnitude of the improvements is, is quite remarkable and it affects both systematic and non-systematic errors. Um, it has, is probably due, most likely due, what we think, due to um, two main changes. There's other changes which, which also probably have an impact. It's always quite difficult to divvy out if you have loads of different changes. Um, once there's a revised weak constraint for, for DVAR and you can look more details on the website. And then we also, changed the interpolation from a quintic vertical interpolation in the semi-Lagrangian um, advection scheme, while before it was a cubic interpolation. And you can actually see that this quintic vertical interpolation has an effect equivalent, nearly equivalent or even better, to increased vertical resolution um, with respect to the semi-Lagrangian scheme. So that's actually quite a positive result and quite exciting to see. Let's look at something else. Um, let's look at the uh, improvements in the troposphere temperature. You can see the blue area. You can actually, as I said, do, do these plots yourself now by just clicking on the triangle. Um, if we look here, the difference is roughly 1%, T850 CRPS, um, so quite a, 
quite a um, good improvement. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you exactly the individual changes due to. It's probably um, can be probably it can be it can be attributed to, to a range of change and not really to a, to a, a specific one. That was two meter temperature. Let's go a bit um, bit further. Um, two meter temperature um, on the surface as well as humidity. Um, you have the um, two meter temperature on the left hand side in the middle. Um, you can see the difference. Um, the improvement, the zero line would have been no improvement. And you can see quite neatly there's roughly an improvement of half a percent point. Um, in terms of significance, it goes roughly out to maybe 216 hours, 240 hours, um, more or less, day 10 um, approximately. Um, Dew point two meter temperature is also roughly an improvement of 0.5%, going out a bit longer in terms of lead time. Um, this is this is due again, amongst many other changes, to revised modus land surface albedo. And I actually have some slides in this, which I'm probably not going to show today, um, but you will find them on the web page explaining you in more detail um, what this modus land surface albedo change actually means. As I said, um, not everything on the scorecard, unfortunately, is blue. I would love it to be blue everywhere. Um, there are some glaring red areas. Um, I'm not going to shy away from that. Um, if you look at the at the glaring red areas, the big red areas, where there's a, where there's a degradation um, against the own analysis, you can see it's in the extra topics, mainly the short range. You can see small red boxes, which are shown there. Um, and in the tropics, it's nearly, to be really fair, throughout the entire forecast range. Um, it's just red from the beginning, day one till day 15. Indeed, if you look at it in detail and on the left hand side, you see the degradation against analysis. It's roughly 1 to 1.5% 1 against the on analysis. If we look a bit more in detail and actually check check more closely, you can actually see there's, a, there's an improvement against ops. Um, so against real observations. If I do T500 in the tropics, for example, you can look um, that improvement is, is up to nearly day 15, um, more or less, um, between 0.5 and 1% points in terms of improvements. So um, although there's a real degradation against analysis and apparent degradation analysis, we have fitted um, closer to the observations, um, which is, of course, something which is probably more beneficial than just verifying, verifying against analysis, which is, um, I think, slightly questionable sometimes anyway. Um, this is due to the use of the first guess from early delivery in the long window data simulation. Um, detailed notes are again on the on the web page. Um, again, it's really against the analysis. It's not against the observations. Observations seem to be improving in scorecard. This was now um, showing you mainly uh, verification against ensembles. Ensembles are our main tool. If you look at the high resolution and the scorecard for high resolution, you can also find on the web. Um, you can also click it similar way. Of course, you're going to have slightly different performance measures on there. Um, it's based on a bit more runs because um, the ensemble is only run for the 00, zero UTC, um, whereas the high res has been run for the 00, zero and 1200 UTC. So you have roughly double the runs. Um, we will update the scorecards the moment we have more data available. Um, so every time there's a chunk of data available, we recompute them and we will, will up them on the website. Um, but if you really compare the high resolution to the ensemble, um, you more or less see the same thing. It's not, it's not really um, worth walking you through the high resolution forecast. Um, you see the same apparent degradation of the, of the forecast against the analysis um, with the high resolution, and it's mostly neutral to positive against observation. There's always small differences, of course, but the general messages are more or less exactly the same. So those those are sort of the, the, the scores I've 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 shown you so far. Um, those are the performance scores which we looked sort of in detail. Um, some of you may have now immediate questions. If you have an immediate question, please just type it into the chat now. Um, it may actually be quite helpful because there's probably somebody online who's been able to answer your question in this instant um, with no delay. Scorecards, as I said, is only, only one part of the story. The scorecards show you one particular thing. They concentrate on certain scores. Um, we calculate actually a huge number of scores far beyond the scorecards. Um, and there's, there's, there's a plethora of analysis. I think the thing 
would I would like to emphasize this and there has been some change um, in the relationship between tropic cyclone max wind and mean pressure relationship. On the left hand side you see the current forecasting system and the pink symbols in there are the relationship between the maximum 10 meter wind speed and the central pressure as reported values from a range of tropical forecasts. You've got the names of tropical forecasts listed down there. And you, you sort of can see quite neatly if you compare it to the model, and the model is the color dots, um, you can actually see there's a sort of issue here. There's the issue that actually for very high wind speeds or, or, or very um, low pressures, the, the two don't match. There's a sort of drop off, and we don't really get to the wind speeds we should be getting to. Um, so we've, we've worked on that a little bit, and, it, and we changed the track on the coefficient over the oceans, and it's reduced for strong winds to really account for this observ observational evidence whereby the drag coefficient reduces sharply for high winds. And when you look on the right-hand right side, you see the new cycle, the next forecast cycle, you can see actually that the model line got a bit closer. Um, I'm not saying we're there yet. Um, we're actually still, still a little bit off, to be fair, and we still have more work to do. Um, but at least we sort of made one step in the right direction. We sort of got a bit closer to where we think we should be um, um, given um, those reported values for observations. Um, we will have to see in the next years what we can do to even improve that even further. Just to stay with the tropical cyclones, um, there has been also a change in the buffer file for tropical cyclones, and we're now going to add to the buffer file for the buffer files the tropical cyclone size, in particular the wind radii um, for 34, 50, and 64 knots. Um, just to emphasize then addition to the existing buffer outputs. Um, the chart on the left actually shows an example of a, of a high resolution cycle also for the next forecasting system initiated at 00, 30th of August 2019. The red dot represents a 12 hour position up to 10 days, up to a 10 day forecast. The four arc lines in, in blue indicate the maximum extent of the 34 knot wind thresholds from the center of this tropical cyclone, so the red symbol position. Um, as you all know, and it's not really that surprising, it's of course not exactly equal for all quadrants. There's actually some, some differences. Um, the product you see here um, is, is not graphical, so we don't have a graphical output for this. We only added it to the buffer file. So if you want to have graphics, you sort of extract the buffer yourself and um, maybe even make a prettier plot than that. Um, and it really is supposed to be, or we hope it's going to be helpful for you to identify coastal areas potentially affected by winds of tropical cyclone strength or um, for certain shipping routing forecasts. The details of this are again on the website itself. Um, let's look a bit at verification. The chart on the right is the mean radar forecast error um, for, one point, so for one nautical mile, 1.85 kilometers for 34, 50, 64 knot wind thresholds up to 120 hours. It's again only for the high resolution. Um, in, in terms of main message, the forecast tends to underestimate the tropical science. So that's science, that's why you have negative values of the mean error as a function of the forecast lead time. So you can see they're all negative. Um, the green line is valid for Northwest Pacific, East Pacific and North Atlantic basins while the orange and red line are valid for the East Pacific and North Atlantic basins only. And the verification is based on best track data. Um, again, as you can see, we still have some way to go in terms of high resolution mean error, but that's how you could use those data. Um, I'm just going to repeat myself here, and I'm sorry for that. Um, these wind dry products are available in buffer through dissemination or for download for free on the website. Um, there is not a web product available for that. You do not have visualization. You will have to create that yourself. Um, we, will, we will have more information in a newsletter article. Um, and there is, of course, as I said, more information on the website. That's it for products in tropical cyclone change, to be fair. Um, another one which has been revised is the convective inhibition diagnostics. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the um, existing model. On the right-hand side, you see the new upcoming forecast cycle. Um, we actually this time made some more effort in trying to communicate what actually has happened. And there's a short YouTube video 
which you can find on the website. And this, this YouTube video gives you a sort of three minute overview of what has happened. It's probably better in terms of what can be explained or what I'm going to explain here in this particular detail. The SIN has been revised to use virtual potential temperature instead of equivalent potential temperature. And there's a considerable reduction of the average SIN values, which you can see um, on these two plots if you compare them to each other. Just stay with the SIN and just come back to a case study. This is a severe thunderstorm which developed in northwest Bulgaria, um, 20th of May 2020, um, produced very large hail. Um, the, I think one thing which is sort of sort of important to mention this, in this context is that the CAPE and the SIN are computed from the same parcel, um, as the current computation is actually for a different one. Um, the reason why the current one for, is actually for a different one is um, simply a computational cost reason. We didn't actually have the resources for a more accurate calculation. Um, now we have the resources to invest to do a more accurate cal calculation. So although we're doing now a, a, a reasonable approximation, it was not exactly the right thing to do. And now we're doing the right thing. Right thing. So that's, that's quite important. Um, that they come from the same parcel means that we can use the vertical profiles and clearly see what's going on in the atmosphere. Um, you couldn't always do that in R4701, and it was not always the case, and that yet sometimes um, some ambiguous situations, if you if you look at the two and compare the two. Sorry. Um, the SIN computation has changed now in a way that makes sense when you look at a vertical profile. Um, I think it gives you a better estimation of the SIN and better assesses the possibility for con convective initiation. Um, you can look at them on easy charts actually in half more detail. There was a change in the SIN, and other change happened in the EFI for Cape and Cape Shear. Again, there's a YouTube video available for you where you can actually look. Um, it's it's um, actually a fairly small change as such, and you can see on the bottom again a difference between the existing and the new model um, of terms of Cape and, K and, and SOT um, in terms of um, extreme forecast index. Um, what really has changed is that currently the EFI and SOT are based on instantaneous CAPE and CAPE shear field. So you've got ins instantaneous values of, of that. Um, and that wasn't always the case if you had a sort of a maxima within the last six hours. In the new model upgrade for the EFI and SOT computations, the new parameters um, will be based on the maximum from the hourly six hours before rather instantaneous values. That sort of should better improve the representation of the 24 hour maximum. So it should be actually a bit better and clearer rather than using instantaneous values. And after the implementation of this cycle for the EFI, um, CAPE and CAPE sure will use these new fields without changing the naming. And new EFI and SOT fields will be generally show better levels of extremity due to better sampling. Um, we will also have um, new parameters coming up for this um, in a later cycle. Um, this time there's actually not too many new parameters, interesting enough. Um, the last cycle, if you remember, we had, a, we had a fairly huge list of new parameters. This time I can actually fit them on a single page. Um, and what you have here is actually um, mainly um, three new parameters for isotropic volumetric and geometric components of the near infrared albedo for direct radiation. Um, and the reason for that is actually they, they, they allow you to derive the angle dependent albedo. Um, and new climate fields um, are available, which give you more detailed descriptions of the albedo. Um, it improves the radiation actually in the model. Um, and these two new parameters will be or are available as output. Um, all parameters are in GRIP1, um, and the turbulent surface stresses are already in the current operational forecast. So these are, these are a list of new parameters. There are some changes, um, and uh, if you use those parameters, those new parameter formats, you have to be slightly careful. Um, so for the event probability, which is type EP, parameters listed, um, the grip header has changed. So if you use those parameters, make sure you test the data, make sure you pick up the right thing. Um, the local definition number has changed from 19, which was the extreme forecast index, to 5, which was the forecast probability. The parameters itself are computed as before, so there's no change to that. It's a pure technical change. Um, I already mentioned the update of the buffer meshes for tropical cyclone tracks uh, for the high-risk ensemble, um, and all of that, again, is described 
in great detail on the website. These were all very technical changes, some of them were very scientific changes. In order to use those new data, I really recommend that you update the software. Um, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of here on a repeat loop every time I give this type of presentation. Um, but that's also because um, sometimes we get questions for that and it's just purely due to people not using a, a new software version. ECMWF will switch its default software to these, to these different versions, which you see here. These new softwares have new features and some bug fixes, but most importantly this time, there's quite an improved performance and more detail is available on a, on a blog post, which you can get from the web page. And I just encourage you very strongly to actually update your software, make sure your software is running and working um, before the implementation of the cycle, before you get data operationally. Um, just a, a quick sort of sidestep on what has been changed in the software. The software packages are now available on Conda with Python 3 interfaces. Um, the two highlight changes for easy codes is, is significant performance improvements and an improved support for Windows in case you need it. Um, the code's UI has been improved. That's the, the, the software which allows you, if you use it, to look into buffer and grip files as an easier location of keys. And then there are some improvements in MacView uh, with new predefined areas and a new improved set of thermodynamic dynamic functions available. Um, as I said, um, this is just sort of the, the, the highlight. If you go to the web page and look for details, you see a long list of, of changes. I just ask you really, please update your software um, if you're using this type of software in order to get the best out of ECMWF's data. Let's do a, a quick recap. Um, start of release candidate in a couple of days, 2nd of June, 00. zero. Test data will be available. Start playing, start experimenting. Tell us what goes wrong, tell us what goes right. Um, implementation is currently planned for the 30th of June. If there's anything which will deviate, deviate from that plan, it will be on the website. We will make it very transparent. It should be very clear what's happening. Um, we also put everything else on, the, else on the website. If you have any questions in terms of implementation, please email us or contact us and just keep in touch with us for the latest news. And that's all I have to say. And the reason why I have Robin Hogan down at the bottom, which I didn't have yesterday, was because I 